Hello everybody, welcome to the Trade Plates TV live show. I'm Rebecca Chaplin and thank you for joining us at our new time of 6pm. Hopefully this is a little bit easier for you to manage around your working day. With me today I've got Andrew Railton from Hello. Martins Group, he's the VW Franchise Director. Yep. And next to him is Scott Shilcock, who is the owner of Prestige Diesels and Sports Limited, who now have the longest trading name in the area. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was writing the news we story all earlier. To break records. <laughs> oh, <that's good. laughs> um, so to start with, how have you guys been finding things recently? Well, generally, uh, the market still sort of seems reasonably buoyant. Mm -hmm. um, overall, we've uh, we've still been um, achieving some good good numbers in terms of sales and after sales as well. Um, so obviously with all the noise around Brexit, it's, um, there has been a, a, a slight impact, but mm. it's, it's nothing too significant in the scheme of things as we sit here at this moment in time. But you, Scott? Yeah, I would say that the week leading up to Brexit, uh, the end of the last week of last month, it certainly quietened off um, considerably. And then just after the Brexit, we had another very quiet week. And then after that, it's all starting to pick back up. There's more positive news coming through. People are starting to relax more about the situation with the Brexit, you know. And um, it, I think it'll, it'll pull back to where it was before. Okay. Um, so joining us today is also the logistics show. And I've got uh, Nona Balkis, who's going to appear behind me on the screen in a second. Um, hello, Nona. <laughs> Um, today, known as going to be talking to us about Alternative Dispute Resolution, also known as ADR. Um, can you explain to me a little bit about what that means? Because even to me, that's not particularly fresh. <laughs> yep, okay. Well, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay, well, these ADR came about really as a result of the Alternative Dispute Resolution for Consumer Dispute Regulations 2015. So, um, probably a longer title than Scott's business name there, <laughs> normally are known as the Alternative Dispute Resolutions um, and Regulations. And they, they came in, they were supposed to come in in July last year, but there was, there was a bit of a sort of backlog with trading standards who kind of look after um, their implementation. So, they actually came in on the 1st of October, the same day as the Consumer Rights Act, um, which probably kind of worked together really, and that's fine. And there were two duties that sort of fall on businesses as a result of that. Um, and they are a little bit misunderstood, really, and I think are possibly misunderstood because a lot of the people that are providing ADR services, alternative dispute resolution services, are kind of pushing the idea that everybody has to do it. But that's, that's wrong. That's a myth. Everybody does not have to do it. Um, there are two parts of the resolutions, as I say. One is, if you've had a dispute with your consumer um, and you can't resolve it, and I think kind of most res uh, disputes get resolved, I think if there is a resolution to have, but sometimes consumers have unrealistic expectations, um, so you're not going to resolve everything. Some things are automatically going to go to court. But if you get to the point where you say to the consumer, look, I've tried this, tried that, this is my final position, we are now at deadlock. So you have to tell them you're at deadlock and you have to tell them about the availability of ADR. Um, and you have to give them the name of an ADR provider. Um, at here, we always tell them, you can pick anyone. We just use small claims mediation service because they're one of the bigger providers. Um, so you're just educating the customer really. But then you say, but we're not required to participate in ADR. So you don't have to, but you do have to tell them. So it's a bit of a strange rule really, but that's okay. <laughs> You know, but if you are a member of a trade association and part of your membership term is that you have to engage in ADR, then obviously you do. So some people are compelled to go into an ADR provider and they will be people that are signed up to a trade association. Um, but most independents who are just going around doing their own thing, they're not going to be a member of a trade association. So they don't have to involve themselves at all, but they do have to tell the consumer about the availability of it, which almost raises the consumer's expectations again, really, which is a bit pointless, but that's the law. <laughs> so is this something that you guys on the sofa have ever had to use? In a word, no. No, <laughs> no, no, never. Is it something that you knew these rules? Um, I, I wasn't fully aware of them. I knew a little bit about them, but I wasn't fully aware of them. And um, I, th I think as we were sort of briefly discussing earlier, you, you, you generally tend to 
uh, reach some kind of an agreement with the customer most of the time anyway without it getting to the point where you need to sort of go to ADR or, or even the small claims court which is obviously this is supposed to be an alternative to mm. um, so uh, I think if you if you deal with customers in a professional manner then the reality is hopefully you can gain agreement yes you will get the odd person that's potentially um, has unrealistic expectations but but a lot of the time you know if you've been in the industry for a number of years you've been dealing with a customer for an, or customers for a number of years um, you, you find ways to, to, to find an agreement whatever that may be mm. yeah you s I think it's all about keeping the confidence there with the customer isn't yeah. it basically and I think you know as, as long as um, you're transparent and you're, you're you're working to resolve the problem from from the start then you don't usually get a problem. I think the problems sometimes come when people come to you sometimes with an issue or a problem and some people might sort of back off a little bit and they're not forthcoming with help. I right. think if you come, if you come, you know, if, you, if you're going to help straight away and you're gonna, you try to resolve it straight away in, in a very positive way, you're giving the customer the confidence and it, it doesn't escalate, does it? No, mm. no. And, and that's what you should do. You, you need to, you know, at the end of the day, you, ne you need to sort of nip it in the bud, don't you, and, and resolve the problem as quickly as possible for the customer. You do. It's, it's, it's the communication side of things, Scott's absolutely yeah. right. If, if you're quite open with the customer saying, you know, this is the route we're going to go down, you know, and you keep them informed in terms of what's happening, you keep them informed in terms of what's going on, then actually if they can see you're trying your best, even if the answer isn't necessarily what they want, they accept that the process you've been through, um, you've tried to do everything you can for them. Mm. So Nona, in your opinion, what is the best way to resolve a dispute? Well, the guys are absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> They've done your job for you, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going home now, so I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they are, they're absolutely right. And, but. I think um, I heard you in the background talking earlier about people come in and say, oh, my, my engine's got a knocking sound. And they think there's something wrong with it, you know, and there isn't necessarily anything wrong with the car. So we've got all those issues to sort of overcome as well. And a lot of our work, um, because we have, well, I know, about 200 cases a month, something like that, um, come in and it's consumers complaining. But a lot of the times it's things like knocks that aren't a fault, but they think they're a fault. And they've run the Citizens Advice Bureau, or they think they've run Trading Standards, but they've actually run the Citizens Advice Bureau and said, oh, my car's got a fault. So the people there, and I, I've worked for Citizens Advice Bureau for 10 years, so I kind of know the system, and they don't give advice so much anymore. What they give is assisted information. So you've got somebody looking at the screen, so they will look on their screen. Oh, customer is reporting a fault with their car. OK, they're entitled to their 30 day right to reject and all those sort of things. So that's when we get letters that have been sent to our dealers uh, and they come in to us. Um, and then we sort of go back and forth. So we really are mediating anyway. And if there's a resolution, we will tell our dealer, well, you've got to refund this or you've got to repair or the consumer's got unrealistic expectations. So no, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to make a commercial decision to go over and above what you're legally obliged to do, then obviously that's down to the property of the dealer. And as the guys have been saying about good customer service and getting your reputation out there and that's a commercial decision to make mm. but very few cases we've seen go as far as ADR we do get cases issued in court I think we've got something like 186 live cases but that's from over sort of the last two or three years cases that are going on and on um, now since oh, the Consumer yeah. Rights Act I'd say the level of cases actual court cases has gone down um, and we're resolving most of those but if they don't get resolved, say that there is the option to go to ADR. But, you know, we've already done everything for our dealers, so it's a bit pointless then going to ADR. And it will be because the consumer hasn't got a case. And that's why we win most of the right. cases that we take to court. Because if we think our dealer's in the wrong, we will tell them they're in the wrong, <laughs> give them the advice. I mean, sometimes they don't like hearing that, but we're there to give legal advice. I think know. maybe sometimes the, the dealers aren't giving the confidence to the customers. And some people, I had a case recently where um, a lady had um, a noise coming from the engine as she described it. So we recovered the car at the, to be safe, to make, you know, you don't want to drive the car if there's a noise coming. And to be honest with you, the, the noise was literally tinware around where the turbo is and everything like that. And um, when you start it up, there's a little bit of vibration, etc. 
and um, this, I suppose it backfired on me a little bit by being very transparent and sort of telling her, you know, what it was or, or even before um, receiving the car and she, and she mentioned that there was a noise, I sort of, you know, you always sort of think the worst maybe. And, um, you know, through the conversations I've had with someone that knows nothing about engines, it's probably in her own mind, in her own head, escalated to something a lot more than what it was. Right. Um, and to, to give you the result of what happened, basically we had the car checked by um, first our mechanics that we use, then I had, because the turbo on this car sits at the top around all this team, I had that checked, and um, the customer came back with a friend that was mechanically minded. He was absolutely happy, but because she'd lost that, that bit of confidence, and in all fairness, she'd only had the car a very short time. Um, she was still very nervous and she knew nothing really about cars. And she said that she'd like to get it checked by the BMW garage, which we said fine. And um, it spent, I think, three days in there, um, them trying to find something wrong with it. And the conclusion was there was nothing wrong with it. Um, and I still sensed that she was not ever going to be completely satisfied. So to give her peace of mind, we extended her warranty by a considerable amount. We actually um, extended it to three years. She'd already upgraded um, to about 15 months. But I did that because I wanted her to go away feeling not like the problem was going to come back because there wasn't a problem, but in her mind, there could have been a problem. Mm. Um, and it just gave her that complete peace of mind and it resolved the situation completely. And so, um, like we were saying earlier, it's about, you, you've got to restore the confidence in the customer's head. Would there be a situation where ADR would be the right choice to make? Sorry, you're looking at me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you're on the monitor. Yeah. Or where you'd advise it. In the trade association, you have to. You don't have any choice. Right. You've got to go down that route. And I don't know whether some trade associations charge. I don't know. But I got a letter in um, this week where someone has said um, in their letter, I've been advised by motor codes to write to you with my case and offer you the chance to compensate me fairly by covering the costs of these repairs. Um, so they've walked away from their conversation with motor codes expecting our dealer to, to repairs and in this case they were they weren't repairs that our dealer was liable for so they've got that raised expectation and then later on we got a letter from the consumer ombudsman um, and they've actually told our client that they are obliged to respond if a customer wishes to escalate their complaint to an ADR scheme and that's sort of suggesting again that the, the dealer has to engage and they don't you know and that's just plain wrong to do that um but i don't know there probably are going to be circumstances but certainly anybody that's working with us we've already fleshed out all the issues and had a look at it but i guess if you're working on your own maybe and you want to avoid court then maybe it's worth going into mediation but that might cost you i had a look on the um, site actually before i came on these consumer ombudsman listed on the trade and standards um, website their cost per case is 150 pound to 600 pound plus vat wow you know yeah so <laughs> uh, <laughs> small claims mediation they charge the consumer i think 50 pound an hour and then the trader 50 pound an hour but that's mediation and you might not come to a result after that so you might both pay 50 pound and you're still going to have to go up to the small claims court um, but you know you're right with what you said earlier this is designed to keep people out of the court because the court system is just so busy um, but so ADR doesn't mean you won't have to go to small claims court then no because oh. still off to court some of the ADR systems they do arbitration which is a bit more you've got a third party and they're going to look at the facts and sort of force a decision on you if you like and you've got to go along with that mm. but a lot of them are just mediation which is you know, it's like relating marriage counselling, you're saying, oh, well, what do you think about this? And, and what's your view? And they're trying to get them to come to a resolution. If you've got a consumer that's fixed on the opposition and your dealer's saying, there's no fault, it's just a knocking, it's just a noise, it's not a fault, or, you know, it doesn't make the car not a satisfactory quality, or all those sort of consumer rights act arguments that we run regularly, then, you know, are the mediators going to be able to get them together? Probably not, and that will end up going to court. So the consumer might have paid, depending on which ADR body they've gone to. The trader will almost certainly have paid, depending on which body the consumer has taken them to. 
and they're still left to pay to issue the claim. And the thing with small claims, which is everything under £10,000, um, which is most used car disputes, most of our cases come in under £10,000, um, you get free mediation as part of the small claims process. Once the claim is issued and you put your defence in, the court then write to you and say, you know, take the opportunity of our free mediation service. So that doesn't cost either party anything at that stage. So if you really do want to mediate, and sometimes dealers want to do that because they think, well, I don't want the hassle of going to court. Mm. They support car five hours away from them. The court are going to hear that in the consumer's home court five hours away. So that means the dealer's got to travel there. They've got to perhaps get a barrister or, or whatever. And so the dealer has an opportunity to mediate there within that process. And it hasn't cost them anything. Um, it, so it sounds like it's just another layer to almost drag things out a little bit further rather than getting the issue dealt with and, and moving on for both parties. Yeah, it is really from there. I think it's been brought in to stop the courts getting clogged up because the courts are very, very busy, Ministry of Justice cutting back. So they thought, oh, everybody can go happy, clappy and go and sort their <laughs> mediation, but it, it's not going to happen. I mean, we've had it for like the Financial Ombudsman Service, for example, PPI complaints, um, finance mis-selling, Section 75 claims, and, and they've been there for years, the Financial Ombudsman. But the problem with them is, they will go outside the law, so they think, oh, poor customer, yeah, that, that's, that's a bit sad, really. So, yeah, we're going to rule for the customer. And they will go beyond the law. So, me personally, I prefer going to court because at least you're going to get a judge who's going to look at the law and, and, and you know, that's what we're trained in our dealers, Consumer Rights Act, blah, blah, blah. And if they're doing all the right things, then that's fine. They should win their case. But if you go up to an ombudsman or any other sort of ADR provider, then who knows what factors someone might take into account so yeah it probably does stretch out the process but i think the idea is to unblock the courts <laughs> it sounds very positive about adr <laughs> you sound like a fan <laughs> right, yeah. um, have you guys got any other questions about adr no no one other thing i wanted to ask you about nona is um if anyone's looked at the story we wrote we published earlier um there's been some talk about PCP being the new PPI, the new mis-selling scandal, and I'm curious to get your legal stance on whether there's anything in it. Uh, your laughing isn't convincing me. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of my desk, I deal with PPI complaints for dealers, which drive me, and it, as I was just saying about the financial ombudsman service, legally, the, a consumer would have no um, uh, leg to stand on at all that they were missold, but the financial ombudsman, I say, they're a bit softer, which was fine when I worked at Citizens Advice Bureau, and I was dealing with consumers because I used to win all the time, but it's not so much fun on this side. We've got a tougher, um, a, a tougher go at it. But um, I've completely lost my track now. Back about your question. Oh yes, PC. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Thing is, PPI is coming to an end, and the companies and lawyers and organisations that are set up to deal with PPI complaints are going to be running out of work. So they've got to look to generate work from elsewhere. So, you know, quite possibly there will be um, some sort of deal made out of PCP, PCP selling. But, you know, I don't agree with a lot of the PPI stuff. A lot of people jumped on the bandwagon with that. So you're going to get the same thing with PCP if it takes off. I've got a PCP deal myself. You know, I think they're trying to say, aren't they, that dealers didn't give enough information, I think, in comparison to HP and, and, and deals like that. But um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it take off, but I think more because there'll be, dare I say, lawyers like me generating <laughs> it from there being an actual problem with the PCP selling, but time will tell. But, uh, PCP, do you not think PCPs have been sold? in more of a robust process over the years than, than PPI. There, there's been more strict rules and regulations that you've got to follow and it's more likely that a customer will have signed a document saying, yes, I've seen all the information, I've seen all the, uh, all the figures, how they all work, and I've signed to say, yeah, it's fine. So as long as your processes are as robust as they should be with everything in accordance with the FCA, then there's less chance of it actually taking off. Yeah, you would hope so, and I think you know, everybody knows the documents now and uh, demands and needs and all those things on there. But I can still produce that for PPI claims that the customer signed the demands and needs, they've asked for PPI and the financial officer will still say, well, we think they were missold. And I say, when the sort of ambulance chasing industry, if you want to talk about it, wants to move on to something else, then I can see they can grab onto that no matter what you've done. But you're absolutely right, you know, 
the FCA, since the FCA took over, I think things are tighter anyway and, and people are doing the right things. So I would hope it would all go away. Um, but, like I say, time will tell. From experience though, all I can say is, is basically, I, I have had over the last few years, quite a few customers that have come in and, and wanted to change their car and we've got a settlement figure and they weren't aware of the balloon payment. Now, arguably, you know, that can be disputed at any dealership, but there, are, there have been people that have come in that are completely unaware and quite shocked that there's this end payment. And I think the problem arises is when everything's based on a monthly payment, mm. and as it has nice been over the years. And it's all about. down to what you can afford a month. Mm. And whether they've had PP, PCP explained to them and HP explained to them, sometimes when a consumer is taking a lot of information in and they're being given figures, they might lose track of what they're being quoted for, although it may have well been explained properly at some point, when they've actually come to sort of settling on what they're doing, I think they've probably mm. lost their way a little bit maybe is probably the fairest way of putting it. But you could argue in that case they've not been missold, have they? They've been sold correctly. Yeah, it, it's they've a just... tricky one because you don't want to sort of sit here accusing people of mis-selling PCP, no. but all I can say is customers have come in and, and you know, been quite shocked that there was a, an end payment. Um, but I wasn't there when they signed that deal. So, I mean, you know, yeah. it, it's open to a lot of, you know, and dispute. It, the thing is, customers aren't particularly financially savvy. I'm not saying everyone isn't, but, but the, the intricacies and details of it are easy to misunderstand or to... Um, Maybe mix up. Yeah, mix one up. Foot, and, 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 and Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's very much a case of people just start seeing numbers and they, and they almost want to forget about it. So they'll go into to, to somewhere else and say, well I, well, I didn't have that explained. I think if you sat down probably with the sales executive yeah. at the time, they'll go, well, no, of course I did, because that's the whole point of what a PCP is. Mm. You know, a PCP is such that you, you pay a payment, you pay a monthly payment, and at the end of it, you have this. And with this, you then have three options where it could start to get a bit of a grey area is, it, is, if, is if people sort of say things like, well, okay, um, I was told that maybe I had equity in the vehicle, which they haven't got. Mm. Uh, but again, it's, a, it's a, his word against hers. But, but judging by what you're saying in terms of PPI claims, if that translates over to PCP, then yeah, potentially it could, it could <laughs> There is one other that. issue there it as well. Be. And that issue is the mileage, because people <laughs> have to give a mileage <laughs> Don't they for a PCP for yep. that for that end? Otherwise, they get for that you know uh, that end value. And, it, oh, and, if, no. and if, they, <laughs> if they get that wrong, then they're open to charges per mile. And yeah. I've seen that several times where where they've they've not put the right mileage in, or they've not discussed that properly, or oh, not gone right. into a lot of depth. And if they've they, they've done an agreement on ten thousand miles a year, and they're doing fifteen eighteen thousand miles, they're then hit with a charge. Mm. Which um, seems really small when you look at it as well, and then can translate into a huge. Until you amount. get your calculator. Yeah. Out. But yeah. this, but this could. I mean, surely this could knock on. This could have a knock-on effect with anything. With just taking anything out a general with, loan, yeah. with taking out a mortgage. I mean, you could turn around and say, right, okay, I want to pay off my mortgage, and they turn around and go, well, well they've got a child. Well, no one told me about that. That's ridiculous. And if you get the ambulance chased on that, every single person in the UK who's got a mortgage could, could argue the same sort of point, yeah. couldn't they? I mean, it's, that's it a bit extreme. It could just snowball but out of control. Yeah, of course it, it could. So yeah. at some point, someone's got to draw a line. So actually, a PCP is a recognised uh, way of financing a vehicle. And as long as your uh, processes and procedures are correct and s someone signed the document, then actually, you know, it was probably explained to the customer because, as I say, otherwise it could just snowball out of control. You could start bringing anything that's related to any kind of finance that you get mm. on anything, and you could bring it in and say, "Well, I was missold it," and it's a his word against hers. And surely the whole point is that once you then sign a document, say, "Yes, I understand it," that is then legally binding, isn't it? Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree. But I say the false decision. <laughs> So I should justify why I was laughing when Scott was speaking, because I've got a PCP and my mileage is 9,000 a year, which was fine when logistics was in Alconbury, but when they moved, of course, I've now gone over my mileage limit, so it's the only pretension I've got with Joel here. So, oh. <laughs> so you'll, be, you'll be on the phone to one of those lawyers then? Oh, I missed, I missed it. And I think where the uh, finance companies could tighten up on that is maybe 
the important ingredients that make up a PCP, the mileage, etc. Maybe there should be a little box that you sign separately so that section is explained a little bit more in great detail because we don't do a lot of PCP, but when we do it, I'm always sort of, and people go, oh, I don't know how many miles I do a year. And the first thing you can do is say, well, look, take a look at your MOTs because that will give you your yearly mileage mm -hmm. and then add on you know, a, a cushion yeah. um, for anything that you might do that you haven't done in the last few years, holidays abroad or whatever. And, and you're better off you know, pushing that mileage a little bit higher and having a, a slightly smaller balloon payment, which won't make much difference to the payments, um, and, and being in a much safer zone. Hmm. Now we've got Scott giving you advice instead. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to jump in the TV? <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, there was a question in there. Did we miss a question? Mm. No? OK. I no. thought you were answering something and oh, I've gone quiet. No, I'm here, I'm fine. Okay, good. Um, anything else you guys want to ask about PPI, PCP or ADR? We've got them all, all the three letter. I think I'm okay. No, no I think we've covered them. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I've covered quite a lot today. That was really good. Thank you for joining us and I'll let you go home. No Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. 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 Um, I wasn't expecting that to be quite so much of a heated discussion about PCP and PPI. But, um, it's, it, uh, for, 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 for the likes of myself, you know, we, we, we look after franchise dealership and, and with obviously a lot of the promotions that manufacturers themselves go to market with, uh, a lot of it is finance based. So mm -hmm. for us, it is a very sensitive issue because we've been, you know, we've been selling finance for, for, for pe pe people to be able to afford new cars for, for many, many years. Um, so uh, I guess, as I said earlier, if, if it does happen, it could snowball out of control. It could get silly, really. And I don't think anyone, particularly, and there are always, you know, the occasional person, but you know, we wouldn't purposefully mislead a customer. No. But uh, you know, as you said, Scott, there are people that, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, misinterpret maybe what was sold. But does that mean we're in the wrong? Well, exactly. I've, it's, how it's do a, you? It's a it's a tricky area for mm. sure. But another, another um, situation I had also was when I purchased um, a car, I won't say what car or anything, but um, the gentleman had quite, he, he also had been doing a lot more mileage and, mm. and had quite a, a, a large um, <laughs> balloon payment. But he went back to the finance company and they did sort out an agreement between them where they would give me clearance on the car, mm -hmm. but he would continue to pay the balance off rather than having to come up with oh, with really? uh, a chunk of money yeah yeah i mean it was it was a bmw car I, I i'm not too sure who the finance was i can't remember off the top of my head uh, it may have been alpha it may not I'm, I'm not too sure but they put in place an, agre an agreement for him to to pay the rest of the finance off and i and i know that because i needed to make sure i had clearance on the car mm. completely mm. and they explained that to me on the phone and i thought well at least you know the the you know the putting in this, the customer situation where it can all be resolved. So yeah, that is good. And so I guess it all depends where it starts from as well because mm. it's the you know it, it it will only start from a, a dissatisfied customer. And again, a little bit like ADR, I guess you know customers may come in and go, oh, I didn't understand that. But if you explain it to them, they go, okay, well let's try and find a resolution as to how we can you know you came in looking at X car or a new car, whatever it may be. Um, then let's see if we can get you into one anyway, but you know, understand this for next time. And as long as you sort that out, uh, uh, customers as a general rule will leave reasonably happy and go, okay, well, I understand it this time maybe, if that's a scenario that's, that's yeah. come about. And happy customers come back and yeah. that's what's I think where the rates are so low at the moment as yeah. well, aren't they? Yeah. Um, you know, years ago when the rates were a lot higher, sure. then you know, a PCP wasn't maybe such an attractive thing because of the cost of the interest and which loaded onto it and everything. But now the rates are so, um, you know, they are really low, aren't they? Mm -hmm. really? Yeah, so. they are, and they are, and that's exactly it. And manufacturers then push that because there are such fantastic deals out there, and dealerships push that. We would push that, you know, because it's a way of getting a customer in, but. You still have to do the job properly, and you know, all, all the franchise dealers that I've worked in and around, you know, do the job the way that they should do the job. Mm. It, but as yeah, I say, it's just someone. If someone grabs hold of it, then then it could be a problem. But it, I think yeah. it's important we all for laugh people about like it, the. But it's yeah, yeah, yeah but I think it's important for someone like the financial financial services ombudsman to say, actually, you know, as I said earlier, you've got to draw a line somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as they do that, then 
it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, and basically, every industry, you know, there's always a, a percentage of people that don't go about their business in the right way. And I think most yeah. of us, you know, we, you know, you've you learned to do things properly and, and get it right the first time, don't you? And make sure you do explain things properly. Yeah, I mean, and not necessarily in relation to finance, but you, you, you learn over the years. Years of experience gives you the fact that actually if you don't do things right in the first place, it is going to come and bite you. Mm. And so more costly. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's not in our interest not to do that. You know, people would have to be thinking exceptionally short term if that's what they were after. But, but I don't think people are because it is, it is an industry that people have a career in and want to progress in and they know that, I mean, it's quite, you know, people know people in the industry, don't yeah. they? You, you, so, um, you know, you, you sort of sell yourself out of the job if you're a sort of person that would go about your business doing things in an incorrect manner, I think. Which basically answers my next question, which was going to be about um, people that sort of mess up the reputation of the industry for everybody else and they'll always be there whether we like it or not right. Scott yeah. says and they're in every industry aren't they yeah, exactly yeah. You know, of course they are you know i came from the jewelry trade and you know we, we we had a great business but you know you hear of someone else in the trade somewhere that's not doing something you know within the law or something like that melting down some gold that came from the the wrong places really? that, well yeah of course wow. there's you know the, you know like I say, every industry's got the, the, I don't know if you want to call I'm them. Not, I'm not trying to talk down car dealers at yeah. all, but. They have a reputation. Yeah. Of course they have don't. a reputation, but estate agents have a reputation, yeah, true. bankers have a reputation, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. There are many industries that when you start looking into it, they do. And, and you're right, they, they, they do have a reputation, but I think manufacturer again, manufacturers have pushed so hard to make sure that, that certainly franchise dealers uh, are taking, a, a, of viewing the customer at the absolute forefront of their business so mm. you know we're measured very heavily on customer service and how you know how our customers feed back and we can't decide to just put surveys in that we think are appropriate it's out of our hands so mm. we have to make sure we look after our customers and you will always get rogue traders that will do things wrong i mean you read about it you know every so often in various various mm. online um, magazines and things and they will always be there, but you you will get them in any industry. I mean, it happens it's on just the stock the way exchange. It, it happens it does. everywhere, yeah, doesn't it? We all insurance, stock yeah. exchange. I mean, I mean, any kind of sales. Banks and people like that. People probably look at them with the same respect they looked at their doctor with at one time, wouldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and now it's sort of like, well, okay, uh, just is, need to check this <laughs> out first. So, is there anything that you guys can do to, or all of us can do I to think, change think, it? Or I think it? collectively we're. We're all working towards it. It's the reality because people's opinion of car dealers has changed drastically. It's, it's I think, better, but, but I think it, it, it's had to. It's had to have been. I mean, I don't know if you do customers. I mean, I know some independents do their own customer serv service, customer survey feedback and things mm -hmm. like that. But again, I've only worked in and around franchise dealers. But you know, the manufacturers are all over it, and and, and rightfully so, really, from a lot of perspectives. Um, and if, and if they set the bar wrong, very are they, high. Are they on you to why has this happened? Why is this person? Well, what what they do a lot of the time is they they generally tend to um, factor in an element of our margin to it. So right. we have to make sure, and and um, you know it shouldn't be that the margin is what drives it, but but unfortunately you know what gets measured gets done, mm. um, and, and and the expectations are very high. But you know I came from a manufacturer background, so from my perspective the customers are the most important thing so in reality we should all be after looking after our customers anyway all the time but as i said you will always get i think i think our reputation has improved because mm. i think you've got you know big gym palaces and the, the independents that are all yeah. really you know well well presented <coughs> showrooms and things like that you go into places like that and actually fundamentally nine times out of ten the people that work there do want to look after the customers and mm. dealers be it independents be it franchise don't want to employ people that don't want to look after customers so you know it's one it's almost one of the prerequisites no matter where someone works in the business yeah. that actually they have a mind for good customer service and not ripping them off as it may once have been mm. yeah i mean the fca rules about showroom rates as well having yeah. you know an even rate i mean that that has made a big difference mm. you can see right if you look at all the advertising that has um, finance in it now they're all they're all relatively within a few percent of each other yeah. aren't they yeah. and for the consumer they've got a much better deal now you know because it was yeah. you know one would get that rate and one would get that rate depending yeah. on the deal but that you were putting forward and <coughs> so and so the other side of it as well is the internet whilst you know 
like it, loathe it, whichever way you look at it, what you have these days is, is people have the ability to look nationwide and mm. pick the dealer based on either customer service or pick a dealership based on you know Google reviews or whichever way around it may be. Once upon a time, you go back many years pre-internet, people would go to their local dealer. There's an argument to say that dealer could then do what they wanted to do because the customer would only either drive down the road or, or just not buy a car. Whereas now, yeah. there, you know, there's so much more availability, people have to be on their game when it comes to looking after customers, pe otherwise... People are, they're, they're prepared to travel as well, Absolutely, aren't they? absolutely. You know, are. we get people, well, I'm sure you you know, come, you know, hundreds of miles sometimes, yeah. you know, for the right car, and some, sometimes it's for the car, yeah. and sometimes because they've looked at you as a business, and they've researched you, probably because they may have had a bad experience in the past, maybe, yeah. and that's what's led them in that direction to to sort of look at a bit at a bit more depth at mm. who they're going to buy from, and and if you've done everything right and you've built yourself up a good reputation, those consumers when they see you as as a business as a whole, and they know what you're like, then they've got much more confidence to come to you opposed to maybe someone who hasn't, because there are dealers that don't they don't ask for reviews they don't post mm. reviews they might only have the odd review that someone's yeah. done off their own back but i think people should should look for reviews you know mm. because you know that feedback is is critical in this in this competitive market yeah absolutely and, and that's exactly it. it's getting it's getting on board with the fact that you need the positive feedback more than the negative but it's encouraging people to do it people are all too quick unfortunately to write a letter to complain mm. they're not as quick to or write post a letter it on the to Facebook compliment. page or something yeah else. absolutely but so you know we, we would actively encourage our customers if, if you've got positive reviews and things please you know let mm. people know about it put it on our, our Facebook page or which or Twitter or whichever way around it may be because actually you know it, it, it drives the internet to understand that we do look after our customers mm. but I think yeah. in, in this day and age people generally do want to long gone are the days the you know the, the older days should we say where as I say they did have their pick of customers where there wasn't the internet and people would just yeah. go to you know their local dealer that's what they did they don't do that anymore so you have to be as I said earlier at the forefront in terms of encouraging people to come in and one of the ways of doing that is through reputation which is through good customer service mm. and I do think every time Amazon sends me an email and says can you review this you bought a spatula on Amazon please review it and I think no, but when someone spent the time one on one yeah. talking to you about a car, it must be a lot easier to convince them to. It's a bit like get eBay, isn't it? Really, I mean, eBay is yeah. there based. You know, a, a lot of it is based on positive feedback. So, all these things are sort of driven that way. Yeah. Really. But you will still always get going back to the original question: the odd rogue out there, the odd people that will that are in it for a very short term for a quick gain that think, oh, I can make a few quid out of doing this. That will unfortunately create potentially a bad reputation but I think you know uh, good independents who, who've been around a few years and, and franchise dealers will continue to push and make sure customers get a good experience because that's what it's all about. Yeah I sometimes feel that in, within this industry you have like car dealers that just want to sort of buy and sell on even if it's a pub with like minimal expense yeah. and then you've got people um, that basically they have a business and they'll take a car in and they'll prep it a bit more, they'll go through it a bit more, but and they'll present it in a totally different light yeah. um, with the backup and that. And you've got sort of, you've still got a little bit of a divide there. Do you follow what I'm sort of I saying? I do, yeah. You, you do still have your, for want of a better expression, your back street garages, don't you? That'll just stick a car on the front, stick a price in it, and then go, you know, that's it. But this is where, you know, again, us as franchise dealers or even Scott as, as, as a, a an independent with a good reputation who spends the extra money and spends the extra time doing it but then it needs to sort of charge almost a premium price for doing it so it needs to yeah. sort of say okay well, it's, slight, it's slightly to, over and above <laughs> we tend to we try not we, we still try to be competitive with our prices well, where to, we lose yeah. out is on our margin um but right. we've decided yes. that we, we want to have the reputation so that you know, at a later point, we've we've built that that yeah. reputation. So when yeah. we want to go a little bit bigger, which hopefully we'll do, then we, we've got that'll help to push the business on further. Yeah. Mm. Um, whereas some people, retention yeah, there, and I think some that. people that they want to sort of hold back on maybe some prep or servicing costs or whatever it might be, and um, you know, and, and take a little bit more margin out of the car. 
And there's nothing really wrong with that, I suppose, but we, we've just decided to go down the route that we wanted to go down and, and we wanted to offer a good service and, and that's what we've done, basically. I couldn't really see you doing anything else and tear your hair I, out of you. <laughs> I just want to go to bed at night and put my head down and not have to, you know, worry no, about anything. Be calling yeah, you up exactly, and, yeah. you know, because, you know, they're cars, we don't bank them yeah. at the end of the day, you know. We buy, we buy, we're buying a second-hand product that might have done 10,000 miles, it might have done 60,000 miles. And for us, it's making sure that when the product goes out, the car goes out, that we've checked it and we know there are no known faults. Mm. Um, and if they are, there are any faults, then we'll obviously put them right, be it if it's a sensor or this, that and the other, make sure the tyres, the brakes, it's all serviceable for the next year. And that's how we sell our cars, really. Do you ever want to just put on the end of your invoices, if anything goes wrong, please be aware we didn't make this car? Or just no, <laughs> but I, I, as you probably know, me and Alexis, we talk a lot. <laughs> and, and we talk a lot to our customers, and it's yeah. not unusual for them to be there a long time. And we, we will talk about you know, the business, how it works, how yeah. warranties work, and make them understand. And then just, and we, I always say, you know, if you ever have a problem, two things, don't panic. And secondly, pick up the phone and talk to me and we'll resolve it. Mm. And you just, I think when a customer leaves your premises, if you, if they leave knowing, you know, you, you've covered everything while you're selling it to them about how you run your business, they go away more relaxed, and if they do have a problem, they can. Be, we had a gentleman bought um, a car, it came in part exchange in Alfa Romeo, and I don't know if it was four, five, six weeks after he bought it, um, he had to take it into a garage. I think it was the inlet manifold on the car. Gone. Anyway, he had a, a, good, a very good warranty with us, and uh, cut a long story short, I dealt with the claim. It wasn't local, but I dealt with the garage he took, uh, took it to, dealt with the warranty company. We, it was all sorted, all paid for, and about ten days later, we got a, a letter through the. Po- oh no, we got an email, basically pointing out how impressed he was, not only with us but with the warranty company. Um, having um, he actually works in, in in that industry. Oh wow! And so he was he was really Stick really that impressed. On the wall. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, yeah. So you know, it, like I say, it's but it's all communication again, isn't yeah, it? Mm. It's it. It's making them understand what they're buying, if a problem happens. Because you do get customers, you know, ask you, especially in the second-hand market, you know, well, what do you do if, if we get a problem because we live 100 miles away? And, mm. and we said, well, that's not a problem. We've got customers everywhere and we'll, we'll have to deal with it over the phone, but we can still deal with it for you. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So a quick qu- last question. I know we sort of mentioned it before, but have you guys noticed, or are you predicting that you're going to see any difference because of Brexit? I think Brexit's a great thing. Oh <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I, I, I've got a really positive feeling about it, to be honest with you. Right. I know, I know everyone, you've got, you know, there's a bit of a mixed divide in it, but honestly, I think, I think there's going to be good things to come out of this. I really do. That's a good way to look at it, isn't it? Well, why not? I mean, yeah. I've watched a few programs without going into too much details on it, but you know, I understand having, you know, and I'm not a politician, but but you know, you've got this uh, EU trading, and then it's become more than that, hasn't it? Hmm. You know, it, they're now sort of making decisions. I think in the program watch there were 72 laws that we opposed, and we lost 72 times. Hmm. We didn't. We didn't manage to change any of it, and you know that's. The, the, but what you about know, your business? It, business, yeah, but you know, there's. We're I'm not, not going to stop that. trading, are we? No. I mean, it, it's a. The thing we've got at the moment is a lot of talk, a lot of hot air, and I think most of the people in Europe, the the, the population, I think they they have that divide abroad as well as in the mm. UK. It's not all about immigration and stuff like that. I think it's, uh, it's about who's ruling your country and who's, who's making the decisions and uh, who is making the decisions in the EU because I'll know baffle anything. anyone to yeah. find out. <laughs> I don't know. What about you, Andrew? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, we, uh, like Scott, the week before, the week after, yes, it felt a bit quieter without doubt. Um, mm. It feels like the confidence is coming back first couple of weeks of July were quiet but you know as, you know, as, as we were discussing 
when I look back through the order bank from previous years, well, actually, it was the same. Mm. So it's just the beginning of a July. It's the beginning of the third quarter. Um, you know, what will happen? I don't know. I don't <laughs> honestly know because it, honestly. It, it, there's, <laughs> at, the mo at this moment in time, there's too many things in the mixing pot. I think the reality is we've got to remain positive. It, this is where I'd say we get our head down, we go to market as best we can, we look after our customers, and you know, there is absolutely no doubt that consumer confidence um, has been affected slightly, albeit we haven't felt it dramatically at this moment in time. Mm. Um, and, and you know, we can't bury our head in the sand and think, okay, we're the automotive industry, so we'll be fine whilst all other businesses suffer. You know, if there is a knock-on effect, we will without doubt feel it. However, I think Scott's right. We've got to remain positive. We've got to go. Well, okay, let's look at the let's look at the plus sides of what we've got here. And from my perspective as a franchise dealer, all I can hope is that um, in in reality, the manufacturers, if they realise that things aren't quite happening as they should be, that they continue to support us in the best way possible. And as long as they continue to do that, that then in reality, hopefully, we will continue to trade. And there shouldn't be a big downturn. You know, I'm sure Scott has, and yeah. I, I have. We've been through. The recession at the end of 2008 that was a significant world changing event that mm -hmm. actually we managed to find our way through I, it didn't we yeah. i remember so. thinking you know it can't be much harder than the last 5 10 15 absolutely. 20, 20 <laughs> absolutely. years absolutely um, it can only get better yeah. <laughs> and i think i think also the the media that you know they yes. want headlines in, in the general media for like the brexit thing mm. they want all these headlines because that's what sells what they do etc and we've had all the negative. We can't have any of that talk in here. In but we've had all the ne yeah. <laughs> we've had all that negativity yeah. because that runs out in the media because everyone's bought. They want to read it anymore because it's. No. And then you're what you're seeing now is some of the positivity yeah. of mm. it. I think China and that have been mentioning that it's a good opportunity yeah. to now do business with the UK. We've got someone out in India, haven't we? Discussing out there, and um, and there's a lot of trade being done elsewhere in the world, and. I, and I, I, I don't know statistically, but from a few things that I've read and, and watched, you know, the, the EU trade was dropping off. Yeah, I think it, I think it wasn't growing. We, we, we just need to, from, from my perspective, we need to dig deep, yeah. sort of find a bit of that British bulldog spirit and go, right, yeah. we, we've just got to make sure we find our way out of it, whatever that may be. At this, right at this moment in time, the answer to the question for me is it's too early to tell. Mm. I do not know whether it's going to affect us or not. There was a couple of weeks, but it's picking back up. We're still selling cars, we're still servicing cars, we're still fixing cars, etc. Um, and it still feels reasonably buoyant and reasonably positive. Yes, all the media again will talk about consumer confidence and the like, but you know, I'm sure we will find our way through it and I'm sure it will remain positive. And, and, yeah. and as Scott said, it can't be any worse realistically than <laughs> no. what has been over the last five years. You no. know? So I'm sure we'll find our way through it. We've just got to go, what's our end goal? What are we looking at? And, that's I think incredible. for a lot of people, it's I'm like to back to the job and just carry on, isn't <laughs> yeah, it, really? Yeah. That is the end of our time, or it was about five minutes ago. That will teach me to talk about politics at the end of the yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who has been watching. I have a message from the judge who says if anyone has a Mark III MR2 for under £750, call him. Um, and thank you to Nona as well from Logistics for coming on the show. That was really interesting. Um, we are going to be back in two weeks on the 26th at Imperial Car Sales, so I hope you can join us then. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.